I am so excited for today. Today's theme, as you know, and this week's theme is making space. And this is my first call, live call with a special guest. Uh, today's guest is Eve Rodsky, who is the author of two amazing books that I have right here and have dog-eared, as you can see. Look at that, Eve's on this call already. So you can see how many things I, I, I really loved in this. And I'm so excited to talk to her about the concept of fair play, the idea of unicorn space, what it is, why it's important, how we can create more of it, and what it has to do with fun and with broader fulfillment and uh, enjoyment and meaning in our own lives. So just as a brief background story before we begin in terms of how I came to find Eve's work, I was at coffee with my book agent a couple of years ago, and I was first starting to talk to him about the idea that turned into the power of fun. And at some point he said to me, you know, there's this book I really think that you should pay attention to because I think it's going to be great. It's going to be a big hit. It's called Fair Play. And he gave me the overview. Um, I should tell you the subtitle, A Game-Changing Solution for When You Have Too Much to Do and More Life to Live, right? Very appropriate for today's theme. And he said, I think it's going to be really big. And so I pre-ordered it on the spot and I got it and I read it. And as Eve will explain more in a minute, the basic premise is that you're trying to reduce res resentment in your household life so that you can actually have time and space for the things you enjoy and live the life you want to lead. And I ended up quoting it numerous times in The Power of Fun because of a very embarrassing experience I had, embarrassing for me, where I read the book and um, I was feeling very fun starved. And I left it out for my husband in a totally passive aggressive move. I should also say my husband is amazing. And we have, we've always had a very equitable relationship. But in this particular moment, I left it on his pillow. And poor Peter finds this book on his pillow, you know, looks at it. But the next morning tries to open a conversation by saying, I read the book last night. He was just trying to have a dialogue. But I honed in on the read. And I was like, you could not possibly have finished that whole book. That's like, how many pages, Eve? It's like more than... 300 pages and I only had two hours. You didn't read the whole thing. And I stormed upstairs and um, threw the book, threw it into a couch. I've never done anything like that and burst into tears. And he was like, what is going on? And so, you know, we ended up having a conversation and our daughter was maybe a year and a half, two at that time. And I guess I had been holding a lot of stuff inside that I hadn't realized I needed to let out. We ended up going through this whole fair play system. He also had a lot of things that he was doing that, uh, that he didn't feel acknowledged for. And before the pandemic, we had a weekly coffee date to actually go through the ideas in fair play and divide up the tasks that it took to run our household more equitably for both of us and to make sure that we knew who was handling what and what that meant. And it was totally life-changing. We already had a wonderful relationship, but it just took it to the next level. So he and I constantly talk about fair play. I buy it for everybody I know. I recommend it all the time. And I did not know when I was writing my own book, The Power of Fun, that Eve had the follow-up book, Unicorn Space, which is all about creating this space you need to be your best self. So that's the backstory of how I came to find Eve's work and why I'm so excited. A background about her, in addition to being the best-selling author of these books, she has a background, I'm quoting her here, <laughs> in formerly advice. Um, she helped people structure philanthropic organizations, which she describes as advising the wealthy on how to give away tons of money to nonprofits that serve the greater good. Sounds like a great thing. And then she came to write Fair Play because of her own personal story, which hopefully she'll share. I'm also hoping people will have questions. And so just to clarify, I'm not gonna be looking at the chat while we're doing this because it's totally distracting and I will be a mess. So if you have questions, please use the Q and A function. I'm pointing to it right now, at least on my screen. Raise hand, probably not as good. Just drop questions in the Q&A and we'll try to reserve a couple minutes at the end um, for some questions from you guys. So with that preamble aside, I would love to welcome Eve to um, turn her camera on and come up and get Hi, Catherine. The spotlight. Hello. And one of the joys of this book launch has been getting to know Eve because her book came out, uh, what, December 29th. Yeah, it was really fortuitous um, because again, I really, really love your work so much um and got a lot out of how to break up your phone and uh I, you know i think again there's there's a lot of practices that you can put in as a foundation for for fun and so a lot of our work definitely overlaps which i and then i will i need to shout out the person who said that their delight was prank mail because i know we're not looking at the chat but whatever prank mail is 
<laughs> if you could tell us later, maybe. <laughs> I feel like that must be um, a, a British participant. It feels. Uh, I, I, I want to know what that. I want to send a prank mail to someone. So I just need to understand what that is because that sounds extremely delightful to me. That's so funny. Yes, please do drop that in, and I can you know, <laughs> find that out at the end. So Eve, I wanted to start just by um, talking a bit about your first book and the ideas behind it in Fair Play. And learning a little bit more about what inspired you to write it, because I think you've got a really compelling story. And then also asking you to describe or explain what you mean when you talk about invisible work or mental load that goes into a relationship or a household. Well, I think, uh, as we said, there, there has to be a foundation for fun. And ironically, the foundation for fun is structured decision making. And so, um, which sounds completely not fun, but I will say that the, the three words that sound fun, that actually really uh, conspire against your fun is the words, figure it out. <laughs> you say, we're going to figure it out. Uh, that's a huge red flag. And it usually means that um, assumptions are going to take the place of decision-making. So how did I get to this, Catherine? You know, I didn't decide to become a gender division of labor expert. It wasn't on my third grade. What do you want to be when you grow up board? It was probably astronaut on there or something. But uh, 10 years ago, my husband, Seth, sent me a text that said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. Um, and that was a time similar to throwing it across, you know, a book across the room. I had not realized how in 10 years of marriage and three years of having two little kids under two under three years old, that I was holding, shouldering two thirds or more of what it takes to run a home and family. That's the statistic. And so it was coming out as crying on the side of the road over this text. But I'll just give you two seconds to picture the scene because it's the exact opposite of fun. It's the two words that people associated with home life, which was overwhelm and boredom, Catherine, which are, that's a lethal combination. I would all need your book. But what happened to me that day, 10 years ago, when I had this newborn baby at home and my little son, Zach, was in his toddler transition program, was I got this text, I'm surprised you get, didn't get blueberries, on the way to pick up Zach from his toddler transition program, which in America, we have no uh, universal child care here. So those programs cost our entire salary. I mean, who needs that? Who needs right. That? And, and there's seven helpful. minutes, right? So no social safety nets. I had a breast pump and a diaper bag in the passenger seat of my car. I had a gifts for newborn baby to return in the back seat of my car. I had opted out of the traditional workforce. Actually, I now say forced out. I actually don't use the word opted out because anybody who is in the traditional workforce, who is a caretaker, who is not there anymore has been forced out in some way. So I remember I had a client contract in my lap, a pen between my legs that was sort of stabbing me um, as I was driving to pick up Zach. And in the midst of all of this, Seth sends me this, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries text, which had me on the side of the road sobbing over these unfairness is, and, uh, and basically thinking to myself, I don't have the career marriage combo I thought I was going to have. I am absolutely miserable, completely overwhelmed and bored. Um, I'm a gray version of myself and I was scared. I was scared of the life that I was going to be living. I, I started talking to friends. One said to me, well, you just need three words to solve your problem. And I said, ooh, what are those? And she said, court ordered custody. So I felt like there wasn't, at least 10 years ago, there weren't a lot of options, Catherine, for how to have conversations that would become this foundation for fun. Um, and then over 10 years, of understanding invisible work, second shift, the mental load, emotional labor, these terms I sort of heard vaguely, but didn't think applied to me because I had an equitable household, did. And so I had to look for a new way forward after basically I hit rock bottom in my, in my marriage. And so what is invisible load? I mean, what is it, what do those terms refer to? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the good news is, you know, Part of fun is gamifying think hard conversations so that you can feel it you can feel it but um what the invisible work is is something that um was coined in 1986 actually it's almost like same shit, different decade if we don't really start to understand how uh, a full life is 
re requires structured decision making about our most important organization, which is the home. Invisible work is um, the most is how I how I got to understand it was asking Catherine the most important question I asked in the past <laughs> ten years, and that question was how did mustard get into your refrigerator? Huh. And why I love that question so much, and that was my favorite research question over 17 countries, is because what I realized is that, especially in the hetero cisgender dynamic, which is where a lot of our assumptions come from, uh, there were women who were telling me they were the ones noticing their child liked mustard with their protein. That's why mustard was a, a topic or something in their home. They were managing the monitoring of the mustard and getting stakeholder buy-in for what's on the grocery list. And then they were asking their partners to go to the store for the yellow mustard after monitoring it and managing the grocery list. And then that partner was bringing home spicy Dijon every time and they asked for yellow mustard. And then Eve, you know, there's no system here because I can't trust my partner with my living will. I, I can't even get the person, this the person to bring home the right type of mustard. So invisible work is really understanding that there's a real conception and planning mode behind the execution work that we see every single day. And yeah. that that's what falls on women often. And that's uh, that mental burden, that mental load of the conception and planning, which by the way, we get paid big bucks for in the workplace. We get paid big bucks for noticing new ideas and planning. But at home, because it's so invisible and insidious, that mental load is what's draining so many people's fun. Because so many people said what the opposite of a delight, the things that didn't delight them was that they couldn't shut their mind off. They were responsible for everything. I didn't even mean to make that sound that I just made. Yeah. <laughs> Shutting one's mind off. Is that like, do people do that? Actually, I, have a they do. Thing I want to they talk do. to you about. With that, but yes, it, it, to clarify to people out there, what Eve was just holding up, the weight in her hand, literal weight, was the stack of cards, the, the deck that accompanies her book, Fair Play. The idea being that there's all these tasks and thought and planning and execution, as she's saying, that goes into running a household. And as she puts it in Fair Play, visibility equals value. You don't actually value it until it's made visible. And also you can't start to actually solve the problem of making things feel more equitable if you don't know what you're actually talking about. So one of the things I love about Fair Play is Eve says, you know, it might sound completely exhausting to try to actually itemize everything it takes to run a household, especially if you happen to be the person who's doing most of the running already. Like, come on, you don't have the space for that. And she says in her book, don't worry, I've done it for you. And indeed, right. in the whole back of the book, there's an end in the deck of cards. She just held up. There's a whole um, list of like all the different cards that go into running a household. One of the examples I really love. Yes, here they the are. Here they there are. Here you go. 60 if you don't have children, 40 if you want to add them. So for those of you who are thinking of having children, maybe you will decide not to. And then I think the other really important piece was you know this very toxic message, right? That outsourcing is sort of the, the panacea, Catherine, right? Well, you just gotta get help and then you can have fun or your mind will, will free up. It doesn't work like that because 50 of the cards are actually non-outsourceable. Um, uh -huh. And I think that's important. As much as you love Alexia or you get the toxic message from your partner, well, you just need to get help if you're overwhelmed. Um, as much as you love Alexia, she's not deciding whether your child's adenoids are being taken out. So I think this it's a lot generation. of, yes. Just wait, just wait, Eve. give them time. They'll figure it Absolutely. Out and <laughs> I think the really important piece here to understand is that, um, you know, there's le levels, right? We're breathing polluted air, Catherine. Uh, you know, we are coming out of a global pandemic. We are seeing all these inequities come up, we are realizing that, um, especially in America, we don't have any social safety nets, especially for single parents, which is what my mother was. Uh, she was somebody who held every single card. Um, and by the way, I, I now, I've been testifying actually in family courts for people who are getting divorced uh, when the judges who don't understand this say that um, a woman who hasn't worked or had gave up her career um, 
is eating bonbons all day. Uh, so I've been doing that for fun. But yes, it's really important to recognize that we are breathing polluted air. Uh, Catherine and my book are not here to tell you that you're having fun without any context. It, but, but we're also saying that while we're fighting for bigger solutions to these problems, we can't not breathe. We still have to breathe. And so, you know, taking agency in your own life to take these actions of delight, um, they're actually, that's a cultural, that's subversive and you're part of a cultural movement. You are all cu cultural warriors with us to reclaim attention for things that you love. I like that idea. Yeah, and I want to get to the idea of um, unicorn space. Um, there was a example in the book that I actually wanted to read a lot in Fair Play that I wanted yes. to read out loud. I should clarify also that a lot of this ends up breaking down kind of in a gendered way. I know there's guys on this call. This is not an anti-guy call by any means. No, look, Fair Play yeah, became a love letter to men. I want to just say that before you read that because yeah, what it as an organizational management specialist, right? I'm a lawyer. I. I I think of the world as design. I think it's so funny that there's all these new design your life people out of art. That's great. But the people who really design society are lawyers. If you want to if you want to have a society where you stop at a stop sign, you're going to be passing a law that people have to stop at a stop sign. So I think about design all the time. And as an organization, the home as your most important organization in the premise of fair play realizes that while one party who holds most of the cards may feel like their situation is worse because they can't shut their mind off. The other party, and often men, will tell me that they think their situation is worse because they don't know their role. You can't get anything right. And that's also a terrible place to be. That's a lack of psychological safety that we talk about in the workplace all the time. And so the way things have been working, the figure it out <laughs> mode, um, is not working for anybody. And my favorite quote was one man who said to me, oh, you mean um, fair play is uh, treating your home as your most important organization? So like, you mean like when me and my wife, we wait to decide who's taking the dog out, right? When it's about to take a piss on the rug. And I said exactly that, but the opposite. <laughs> Whatever that is, I want you to do the exact, the opposite. Right, right. And I think it is interesting to think that, it, it, again, speaking in broad strokes, but among certainly my friends, there tends to be this feeling on often the woman's side that you've got all this emotional labor of trying to figure out everything that it'll take, for example, to celebrate your kid's birthday, right? Like you're doing the conception of even thinking we need to plan a birthday party. And then you're doing the, the planning of what that will take all the individual little pieces. And then you're actually doing the execution. But sometimes, you know, the other person will come in during the execution phase. And then it seems as if that's the important part, but actually who actually planned all of it or the example Eve that you give in fair play where you talk about dinner making dinner when you right. think about what goes into making dinner a lot of times we give credit quote unquote to whoever makes the dinner like actually cooks it but then if you ask well who got the groceries <laughs> who thought to put them in the fridge that's a totally separate that's the conception and planning part right who, who planned the menu yeah who, who so, knew that you weren't gonna have pizza four nights in a row right that that work that invisible work that we're talking about here is really the impediment to fun. Yes. Because it really is. Because the more that, and, and by the way, I mean, this isn't new, right? Virginia Woolf said that women need a room of one's own and that we couldn't be Shakespeare. Um, we couldn't delight in writing because we had no mental space or physical space. And that is why the, the foundation for fun is this secret formula that Catherine and I will talk about but it's a secret formula that um, is un unwinds in fair play, which is the beauty of boundaries, systems, and communication. Well, actually, let's dive into that because I don't want to run out of time to talk about that. Basically, what I was going to do from the book is just explain this great anecdote Eve has yeah. of being totally frenzied getting onto a plane with her cousin where they're trying to check off all these lists, deal with the direct, you know, the, the satellite installation and deal with the soccer practice, babysitter, all this stuff. And then there's a guy sitting across them from the aisle who just looks so calm and relaxed and just leans back in his chair and does a PowerPoint presentation for a while and watches a movie and then appears to just do some math problems for fun. And her cousin leans over and just goes, I want to be that guy, which is a kind of, you know, funny comment, but had something deeper where it was the idea that that guy clearly has the mental space to just be more engaged in his own life and have what Eve refers to as unicorn space, which 
in Fair Play, you write, is the time and space to reclaim or discover or nurture the natural gifts and interests that make you uniquely you, driving you to be the fullest expression of yourself and make life worth living, which I just thought was so powerful. So if, yeah, I'd love it if you would tell us about what you see as being the three fundamental pillars of the ability to create unicorn space. Well, again, I mean, why I love your book so much is I think, um, again, the, the understanding that we are in a practice of fun. Our life is a practice. Um, and so if I say I'm in a practice of exercise, um, Catherine, I haven't exercised probably like a year, but I still feel like I'm in a practice of exercise. You so I think dancing, Eve, you have, I have been dancing. Days. That's at least I had only except for yesterday I had 552 steps. So I don't think I'm going to wear my eye watch anymore. Um, so I think the beauty of what we're talking about today is understanding that the practice of fun doesn't mean that we're always going to be happy. Um, and I think a big piece of, of the misunderstanding is, is even the definition of mental health. And then we'll talk about how that's really the boundaries, systems, and communication that we need to have fun. So what I found really interesting in unicorn space, which ties back to the fair play stuff, is that we often say to our kids, to ourselves, I just want to be happy. Um, and that is not such a great frame of mind in which to structure your, your fun. Um, and so basically what the, um, the, the structuring of fun is not, uh, you know, just looking at how can I necessarily have fun today? It's understanding that the habits and ritual of fun um, need to be included in a life where the definition of mental health is how to have an appropriate emotion at the appropriate time and the ability and strength to weather it. And so what do you mean by boundaries when you say we need to, this first step is to establish boundaries and this trifecta that Eve has of boundaries, systems, and communication. So boundaries, systems, and communication is understanding that the foundation for what we're talking about here is one, recognizing that systems as we just talk, talked about, the systems we just talked about are really, really important. So you mean the idea uh, of breaking it up, like actually making it invisible, visible. Exactly. We have to have a way in which we have some structured decision making around our home organization, because otherwise the decision fatigue is going to kill us. Um, and that is the dark side of fun, right? It's understanding that if we don't address this, then what happens over time is that we have a passion gap that I found in my research. And this was now research in 17 countries with um, people that uh, mirrored the US census. And I tried to do my best to ask questions about economic status, um, ethnicity. And what you see is there's these real hurdles around people being able to unleash their life because they lose a passion gap, meaning they're defined by their roles as parents and or partners and professionals. One of the co com most common things I heard was there's no permission to be unavailable from our roles. So that systems piece is really important. But the other two layers for how to really have a life of fun is really understanding our boundaries and our communication. So let's go to that because we spent a lot of time just breaking down the system of fair play, which is really, really important as a, a, this foundation. But boundaries are equally important. And why boundaries are really important is because a passion gap will leak in. So for me, Catherine, it started when Zach was given to me in the hospital. All of a sudden he was handed to me and the nurse said, hi, mom. It was the first time my name had been erased from me. That day, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries, that toddler transition program I was going to. I was sitting with other moms and a couple of gay fathers in a group where the preschool teacher told me, these people are gonna love you and nurture you and be your best friends. I looked down at my name tag, Catherine. It said, Zach's mom. And I'm thinking, wait a second, these are the people who are gonna know me best in the whole world and nurture me. They don't even know my fucking name. And so a boundary is pushing back. It's not a walk around the block. It's not a, sadly, even a drink with a friend. A boundary, a true boundary is recognizing that you uh, deserve it to be interested in your own life. And giving yourself the space to do that, to create the boundaries so 100%. that you actually have the space for that. Uh -huh. 
And to do that, especially if you're a minoritized population or um, anybody that's not sort of has the necessarily white Christian male privilege that we often give, um, anybody who's not that population um, has had a message where their time is not valuable. So a boundary is, is more complex. It, again, it's not just a walk around the block for people like that. For us, it's having to push back and fight back that we deserve space, that we deserve the space to, to be unavailable, the space to pay attention to things that we love, and especially the space to understand that most of the world is conspiring to use our time in service of others. Time is our most valuable currency, Catherine, and especially as women, we're conditioned to give it away to others for free. The and so how glorious is it when we can spend that time on ourselves? I completely agree. And I also think you bring up an interesting point that it's often difficult for us to give ourselves permission to do that. So in some ways, it's creating a boundary to protect ourselves from ourselves. Um, right. I think that a lot of people have trouble giving themselves the permission to have fun or pursue something that might lead to fun, the permission to claim their unicorn space. Uh, so I think that one exercise for everybody in the call today to experiment with is to really think about the idea of, of what are your personal what are your resist what's your resistance to the idea the ideas that we're talking about of claiming time that we just for you or just to pursue a passion or just to pursue something that might be fun what is that resistance and can you give yourself to permission to enjoy your own life and to seek that and to be kind to yourself and thoughtful towards yourself in the same way that you probably are towards the other people in your life Absolutely. So and to not be interrupted because women on average were interrupted every three minutes and 42 seconds during the pandemic, according to one time journal study. And we cannot have fun in three minute increments. Uh, we need sustained attention. And that's actually pretty subversive in a society that doesn't want us to use. Uh, and so the other exercise I will ask, and maybe you can put into the chat, even though I know we're not, I'm not, I don't see it, but, um, or we can scroll later, but I, I have a question to ask you all, and that is, um, is there a time in the next week where you can say in your journal, you write down in your journal in the morning, what is the most important thing I will be doing today? And I want it to be outside your roles as parents and or partners and or professionals. By professionals, I mean people in caretaking roles, people who work for pay. So Say one again, Eve, what is the what is the most important thing you'll do today? What is the most important thing I will do today? And I want one day this week for it to be outside of those three P's. Of the say that again, the professional, the professional partnering, uh, and parenting. So, and by by professional, I mean anybody who works paid or unpaid as a caretaker. So, what is the most important thing you I am doing today? And I want it to be outside of your roles. So in other words, what is a way that you could claim your unicorn space? That's Correct. That. Well, that's it. I want to hear from people. The most important thing I'm doing today is I'm getting my skis back on. The most important thing I'm doing today is I'm meeting my crochet group. They're, they're, my a good friend, Renee, who's at 56, became after a stay-at-home mom. Um, she, she said that she was so, um, it was so hard for her to be defined by her four kids as just mom that she felt stuck. So to get unstuck, she needed to drive a car fast. And now at 67, she's one of the top rally car racers in the world. So shout out to Renee, she's in Antarctica right now. Uh, and she raises money for child trafficking. So we don't all have to be Renee, but I do love this idea. It's never too late to recognize that we do have that need for speed or that we can connect to our values. But that's when we model that for, for our kids or for the people around us, that's a boundary. That's why I'm asking you for, to do this exercise. That's a boundary to hold that and to say, my boundary is the most important thing I'm doing today is something for myself. And how rebellious does that feel? I mean, it's, yes. kind, of, it's kind of horrifying how rebellious it feels where, where even he, me being who I am hearing you say, oh, the most important like an example is to get, put your skis, get your skis fixed again, right? So you can go skiing or pick up your, like even I am like, oh, that doesn't seem like that should be. And then I'm like, no, Catherine, actually that's exactly the point, right? It's like, why, why is that not important? Why? why? Important I want the most else? important thing to do is to browse thrift stores or whatever it is. So, yeah, um, yeah. You know, it is, it is, um, it can sound privileged to have that time, but actually it's the opposite. 
What was very interesting to me was that the people who identified in the 9.9% um, of my research, Catherine, were actually having the hardest time identifying fun or a unicorn space. And what I think happens is as we start to hit milestones of success in, in society, we start believing that we need to shrink into these, um, into these buckets, right? I need a, a new car, I need a better car. I should have another kid because everybody around me is having three kids. We start to let our extrinsic, our, the extrinsic societal definitions of success guide our decision-making. And so my friend, Mark Mamuthi Joseph, who uh, he's a spoken word artist and he's the head of the Kennedy Center. He has this beautiful quote that I love to talk about, which is that in communities where there's not a lot of financial capital, other capitals have come to the forefront. And that a lot of that has been creative capital. So I ask us all, can we trade in another type of capital other than financial capital? Creative capital is really, really powerful. Yeah, and I've, I've actually had a quote I wanted to share from your book, um, just in this line, along the lines of what can we do to reclaim this for ourselves and to build our own personal creative capital, which is, and it might help spark some ideas for people that they can put into the chat, but it's what would you like to create more time and mental and physical space for today? Don't hold back, allow yourself to dream. It may seem like a fairy tale, to carve out time to play piano again or research the business idea that you've backburnered for five years. But reclaiming your unicorn space is worth your time. Give yourself permission to let your desire resurface and make itself known. Make itself That's, known. And it feels That's so hard subversive. Part. Yes. It does. And that, by the way, that completes our formula. Our secret formula for today is boundaries, systems, and communication again, as the, as the foundation for fun. So we talked about systems, right? This idea of an ownership mindset, understanding structured decision-making, who knows who's doing what in advance. So you're not deciding who's taking the dog out, right? When you're about to take a piss on the rug, that's systems. Hopefully boundaries. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> not you. You're taking a piss on the rug, we've got bigger problems, yeah. Boundaries <laughs> is, as we said, is this idea that you um, deserve to be interested in your own life. And then communication is such an interesting one, Catherine, because I really believe that to be able to have fun um, without guilt and shame, without all the layers that can surround us, that can eat into our fun, that can erode our fun, we have to be able to ask for what we need. Yes, I completely agree. And to ask for what we need is actually a really complicated process because communication is, is self-talk and what you say to others. So the self-talk we've already captured. We said, you know, you're gonna to say to yourself, I deserve a permission to be unavailable. You're gonna to say to yourself, I deserve one day this week to answer that question of what's the most important thing I'm doing today, make it outside of your role. That's the self-talk. The other piece of self-talk that I wanna address is when guilt and shame comes in. If you're somebody who often feels guilt and shame or could feel that, like I do, you know, I'm not putting Anna to bed tonight. I feel so guilty. The self-talk reframe for communication that's very helpful is to, again, couch what you're doing in your own agency. So I'm, I'm feel guilty for not putting Anna to bed tonight. We can say, I made the decision not to put Anna to bed tonight. I made the decision not to put Anna to bed tonight because I really wanted to see my friend, Rebecca. She hasn't been doing so well. She's been really you know, down in the pandemic and I miss her. When you say I made the decision because instead of I feel guilty because I have a journal just to do these reframes for myself. That's self-talk. And then the one thing I wanna say about regular communication is that uh, actually, shout out to the UK, but my friend showed me that there was a Facebook group called The Reasons I Hate My Husband and Kids During COVID. 27,000 members, Catherine. One woman posts in this group, if my husband dies during COVID, it won't be because of the disease, it'll be because of me. So a pretty provocative statement. Uh, I DM her and say, 
uh, hey, I'm a researcher on communication. I'd love to know how you communicate about domestic life, you know, your boundaries, how you ask for what you need. And she writes back, I don't communicate about domestic life. It's too triggering. This is my safe space. So I wanna reflect on the fact that this woman felt that publicly threatening to murder her partner in front of 27,000 strangers felt safer to communicate than talking directly to her partner about what she needed. And that is the problem with communication. We think of it as a one-off. We think of it as something that is triggering and scary. Whereas when we can look at it as a practice for asking what we need, uh, check in when emotion is low, Cognition is high, as opposed to just in the moment, feedback in the moment, um, throwing things at people like you and I have done in the past. Uh, it becomes much easier to create a practice of fun. I think that's such an important point to talk about how it can feel very scary to actually bring this up. And I think that one thing that um, Eve talks about in her books that's really useful to keep in mind is that it doesn't need to be an accusatory, you know, I need more space. It can be more of a team thing where we both need space your partner may be feeling resentful about things as well and if you can come at it from let's figure out if there's a system that we can adopt to make things feel more equitable so that we both have the emotional and mental space we need to feel fulfilled in our own lives i think that that's a really useful approach to come at it from um, we only have a couple of minutes left but i wanted to take the time to address i think one of the biggest questions and uh, issues people have when thinking about either fun or unicorn space which is the freak out moment that a lot of people have, and I had this myself too, where you think, well, if I had the space, what would I do with it? There's a question in the chat here from someone who says, I don't have any hobbies or interests that are not achievement oriented, except for a massive reading habit that I 100% admit is escapism. My therapist wants me to find something that I enjoy, quote, just because, mm -hmm. and my brain literally does not compute that phrase. So that, 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 would you recommend any, any tools? Before tossing that to Eve, I want to say just first of all, you're not alone. That is a common issue. And I know that it can be hard in talks like this when you're asked to come up with on the spot, what are you passionate about? What are you, you know, what do you want to do? Like nail it down. And you're thinking, I don't know. That's why I came to this talk because I don't feel like I know what that is. So well, do we have that, a couple of minutes to play? Let's play. Let's have Yeah, because I was going to say the whole idea, just let that percolate in your subconscious. Don't worry about answering it right now. But yes, Eve, what would you say to that person? Well, I think we, we should play. I think we should okay. play. So um, as a lot of people say, I like to go dark to go light. Um, you know, this is th these ideas that we're talking about is, is the foundation for fun, right? So, so a lot of this can feel very triggering. It can feel very triggering uh, to that person who says, who gets, who has a therapist who just says, you need to find something because that means that that therapist doesn't understand all the barriers and hurdles to invisible work, to our systems, to our boundaries, to, I mean, to our communication styles uh, that our society has literally taken our time from us. Um, so once you realize you're not alone, I think it does, it does ease the fact that you can be easier on yourself, gentler on yourself. This is a practice, but remember we're the culture that, that when women enter male professions, salaries automatically go down. We're in cultures where we say things like breastfeeding is free um, when it's an 1800 hour a year job, right? So we're in a culture that devalues our time. So pushing back, this is subversive. So we have a couple of minutes, let's play. So there's this fun game. And I would say you can, if anybody wants it, it's a prototype. So I'm looking for data. So um, mm -hmm. Catherine, if, if you have your listeners or viewers want to email you, I'm happy to send a prototype of this game. So let's, <laughs> let's play. Um, I don't know if we can bring somebody up, but whoever asked that question, um, I don't know if we can bring her up or we uh, can- Candy Jones, Conde, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. And I'm also, let's see, um, maybe raise your hand. Okay, fine. If you question, can raise your we'll hand or, or we can, if you can keep putting your stuff, oh, someone's raising their hand. I mean, virtually raise your hand. All right, we're yes. gonna work. Oh wait, I just raised my hand. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're gonna. Guys, I'm a pro. No, go right. ahead. So Christy and Jessica, either of you can figure out how to first to bring that person up. That'd be awesome. And I'm gonna not touch my computer. But if you can stay with us for a couple more minutes, I think this is really a fun way to get inspired. Um, and this is great because it's a fun way to be able to have talks where you're in groups where you're not just talking about your roles, how's work. How are the kids? It's like, ah, I don't want to talk about that stuff. You know, that's not fun. Um, okay, so do we have a, uh, so we need someone who's our uni 
and we need to be her spiritual friends. And the chat can be the spiritual friends that can help us make um, decisions. So who's going to be our our prototyper for right Gretchen now? Gretchen up here, I think. Okay, I'm Gretchen. Sure. Hi. I think you can unmute yourself. Oh man. Is it... Yes. Oh, okay. Hey. Look at us. Hi, Gretchen. Hey, I'm unmuted. Yes. Okay. So you're going to play. You're our contestant. I really didn't raise my hand, but I'm willing. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I love that's it. That's a fun mindset that, that we all right, all that's a fun mindset. Being <laughs> open, exactly. Okay, so here we go. Okay. So this is how it works. And for everybody, and this is really for, I think, Ken Day, you said, who had the question, this is for you. Okay. Um, so we're going to, and again, if when you have the cards, it's easier. I now I have to just say them all. But when you see them in front of you, it's a little easier. So I'm going to read you some <laughs> cards, a lot of them. And the rest okay. of us are listening. And the goal is we're going to take what Gretchen is speaking to her right now, and we're going to combine another card to give Gretchen ideas for what she could do for fun this week. Okay. So for example, one of my friends said she loves art. So one of our other friends found axes and arrows in the deck. And she said, Ooh, you're really angry about what's happening with um, abortion in the U S what if you drew your art about that? And we went to an ax throwing place and we threw axes at your art, that would become rage art. So we're here to remix different things together. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start reading some cards and you tell me what resonates with you and I'll tell you when I'm done. And then all of us have to listen for what other cards we're gonna combine. You wanna okay. say like, yes, no, really quickly, like a gut, like, yes, no, yes, no. Um, no I just want Gretchen to listen and okay. then I'll tell you when I'm done. Okay. okay, writing, teaching, and you're picking one, researching and learning, design, math and sciences, Arrows and axes, music, running, beauty, pottery, florals, photography, gardening, water sports, travel and culture, outdoors, performing, animals, dance, rhetoric, speech and debate, martial arts, memories and archiving, sports with wheels, sports or sports with balls, design, Racing, travel. Oh, we did travel and culture already. Um, circus, theater and production, triathlon, metallurgy, art, stitching and needles. Okay. Um, just so long, I, though, Gretchen. <laughs> yeah. I know metallurgy. I wasn't sure what that means, so I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> but we'll go with. I highlighted learning, music, uh, travel. Okay, just pick one. You have to just pick one. Oh, I, only, I can only pick one. Okay. Just, well, the, the thing keep that, that list for yourself. Yeah, you keep the list. But what is what is what was the card that like spoke to you most right now? Travel. Travel. Okay. Now tell us why. I want to know your values that are associated with travel, or why did that card? Why did that card speak out to you right now? Um, I think one is that it's been something I can't do for the last two years, so there's a lack of it. Um, secondly, I feel like I always find myself when I'm traveling somewhere different, something new. That experience is super rewarding to me. Okay, I love that so much. And uh, what values does that bring up for you as a person? That's a harder question. Yeah, it, it almost connects to some of the other cards you read, but just learning, um, appreciation and gratitude, uh, th just the fun of discovery. I love it. Okay, so now we need a couple people in the, we can read their answers that we're gonna combine some cards for you. So for example, I'll go first. Okay. I would ask, I would combine travel with running. Uh, or walking. And what I would say is if there's a 5k or something that's in a town that's not that close to you that you could travel to, um, then you can start exploring local local towns. Okay, we're getting a lot of more here, which I love that are better than mine. So Catherine, do you have one for Gretchen, a, com a combination card? What I heard her come up with was um, just to say the words back to you that you just said to your said that I stood out where it makes you find yourself you like to try in something new you like the well you're attracted to it because you currently can't do it <laughs> the learning 
an appreciation and gratitude and then a sense of discovery. So I wonder if you could um, combine the interest in travel and your interest in discovery with actually finding something in your local area this week that or weekend that you know about but never have actually gone to 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 and ideally going with somebody else and maybe even today and tomorrow asking friends for their personal favorite secret spots Mm, where you live and then inviting one of them to either go with you to it or to have them show you one of their favorite places so as a way to build in some connection and a feeling that you're traveling and discovering something new even though you're not really going very far love it that's what oh I'm my about. God. I love that so much. Um, I, somebody in the chat did something, said something really beautiful, travel and the card of memories and archiving. Um, and I love that too, because in a time where we can't travel, is there a way to scrapbook or go to Michael's and take some of your favorite trip pictures and uh, put them together in some sort of more beautiful way? These I are like great. It. Thank you all. <laughs> So the point of this game is, again, not to find your one passion. That's not the point of either Catherine or my book. It it is, we're looking, oh my God, I I just had to go into the chat and it says travel and performing animals. I love that idea. Um, I don't know what that would mean. I don't know, but I I love the idea of combining animals with, um, and then Gretchen, right, we want you to tell, tell, you have to come back and share with us. So maybe on Catherine's Instagram, We'll follow you, Catherine, and we'll maybe if Kat, if Gretchen, you'd be willing to share. Um, it would be an inspiration to the rest of us. Um, yeah. I love I like the idea of travel and reading. That's a great idea of going to a bookstore to look for different places. Um, I love all this. So the beauty is, this is um, again, it's a way to get inspired. It's a way to generate ideas for yourself. Um, and then the beauty of ideas, I love to have an ideas notebook. As you know, I love notebooks. You can tell now because that's where I did all my research. But I have a notebook just for these types of ideas. So what I'll do after this is write some of these down for myself because I learn and get inspired. And then you can hand out ideas to other people. It's the best gift ever. The best Valentine I think you could ever give to somebody else is an idea for how they can they can have fun. I love this. And I I thank you so much Eve I wanted to say someone just put in the idea of creating a menu based on past travel I mean they're just oh, they're just flying that. and I think that um this this actually is a great way to wrap up and to give everyone on this call an idea for what you can do this weekend to tie into our theme of making space and trying to generate fun no matter what circumstance you're in right now so I would encourage you, you know right now we're sort of a fun squad of our own in this call exchanging ideas over the chat but what if you did something similar with someone in your life this weekend, with your friend, with your spouse, with your kids even, right? Like try to brainstorm or talk about some of these factors that bring fun to you and then brainstorm ideas for how to bring some of those. You could even start with the prompt of what do you wish you could do right now, but maybe you can't, right? Because that's kind of where we just started. You're not able to travel the way you might like. And you're certainly, even if we didn't have the pandemic, it would be hard to have a weekend vacation that you started planning right now this second. Right. What could you do this very weekend? Um, So I I invite everyone to experiment with that idea this weekend and to report back. You can always respond directly to my emails if you want to just send a direct story because I'd love to feature some of them in the newsletter. And as Eve was saying, we can do we can use social media for good and actually do it that way. For good. Yeah. Um, And again, on your newsletter, again, if you um, if you want to send your address, um, our team, our shipping warehouse will get you some of these, the prototypes, because I'm really looking, as I said, I love data. And so how you use the cards, the combinations you come up with, um, sharing that with me is going to be really helpful as we uh, move forward and, and, uh, and iterate on, on what we learn about unicorn space and fun. So on that note, so Eve's website is fairplaylife.com, which I will put in my Yeah, newsletter. so maybe the best way to do it would just be to email info at everadsky.com. And if you give us your address, we'll send you the cards. Is that like, you don't have any limit on this or like how? No, no, we're good. We really, we're good. We have a great warehouse. Um, okay. Australia is a little hard, but the UK, we ship to the UK and Canada. Okay. So info at evrosky.com. I can yeah. also throw together a jot form, which I can put into my newsletter. Great. So it'll be really easy to collect addresses. Um, and then, yeah, then we can reconvene at some point and see what comes We should reconvene tonight. and see what people did. I think it'd yeah. be so fun to do a fun intervention number 2.0. 
and to see what some people did with uh, their inspiration. Yes. So, so thank you everyone who made time on their, why do we know it's Thursday, Thursdays. I was like, what day do this? <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, you, thank you so much. It's been such a personal pleasure to get to know you through our book launches and it's just so fun. And I'm so excited to be collaborating and spreading these ideas to the world. So thank you for your time and for everything that you do. I love your community. Um, thank you all for such an active chat. Yeah. Uh, you are the best. Your time is diamonds and we appreciate you coming with your boundary systems and communication to up-level your fun. Excellent. All right. Well, I hope to see everyone. There is a call on Monday, as I've mentioned with Tom Vanderbilt, who is the author of Beginners, the Power and uh, the Joint Power, Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, very tied into what Eve was just talking about in terms of why we should let go of our inhibitions and actually try new things. So I hope you all will be able to join me for that as well. And that will be at noon Eastern on Monday with Tom. And um, yeah, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful weekend. Put some of these ideas into practice and I can't wait to see you all. Bye. Bye.